we now look at some extensions, some refinements, some additional rules uh, to the two that we've already seen for plotting a root locus that will help to kind of clean up the locus to make it a little bit more precise. So as we've already mentioned, that the two rules we've seen, the real axis rule and the asymptote rule, plus some experience, are very often enough to sketch a root locus plot. But sometimes there's some ambiguity. And in the previous examples we looked at, maybe example number two and number five would be hard to do without a lot of experience in knowing what a root locus plot is supposed to look like. And so the additional rules can definitely can, can help with that. There's three that we're going to look at. One has to do with uh, the angles at which the poles depart their open loop uh, locations and the angles at which they arrive at the, the open loop zeros. We're going to look at what happens when branches of the root locus intersect each other, and we're going to look at what happens when the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. And so those three additional rules will really help a lot to make a root locus uh, a little bit more fixed. The asymptote rule was pretty helpful. Uh, so looking at this example here, we have an idea of what's going to happen in it. I've got the left example and the right example, and they're, they're similar, except notice that the complex poles and zeros are, are swip, uh, swapped, switched in location between the left plot and the right plot. So if we do the real axis rule to figure out where the locus is on the real axis, in both cases we're going to find that pole goes that way and that pole goes that way. And in the left plot and the right plot, we'll know that this pole generally goes that way toward the zero, and that pole generally goes that way, and, and similarly, those go that way. But what we don't know is how they do that. Um, so it's possible that um, this pole here in the process of going to the zero does something like this and becomes unstable, or something like this like that would be the, the conjugate, or that this one does that, or that. It's also possible, uh, before we figure this out, that the pole instead does something like, like that, and it goes inside. So it turns out that one of these plots here is going to be stable for all positive k. In other words, the locus is going to stay completely in the left half plane, and the other one is not. And so it would be helpful to be able to figure that out. And what would help us here is to know, as this pole leaves this open loop location, does it tend to go uh, to the left or to the right? To what angle does it um, depart from uh, its original location with? So we're going to consider an example here. And so our example, it has a, our open loop plant is 1 over s times s plus 4 plus 4j and s plus 4 minus 4j. So we have a pole at the origin. We've got a pole at minus 4 plus 4j and a pole at minus 4 minus 4j. And we would like to know how poles leave P1 and P1 complex conjugate. Um, in what direction do they go? We know the, the pole P2 here, we know it goes straight left by the real axis rule, so that one's not very uh, exciting or, or difficult. But And we know that uh, we have these other poles here are going to go off at angles of plus minus 60 degrees ultimately, and they're going to start out um, at some alpha, which is going to be uh, alpha equals P1, which is maybe at, oh, it's at uh, minus 4, plus 4J, and P2 uh, is at minus 4, minus 4J, we add those, and then P2 is at 0, all of those over 3, 4Js cancel out, and I get minus 8 over 3rd, over 3, is our alpha location, so a little over minus 2, so somewhere around here. So that's our alpha and our asymptotes are going to do something like that. But how does, in what direction does the pole 
depart P1 to head toward that asymptote? Does it go straight right? Does it go up? Does it go down? We don't know. So this is what we're looking at doing. And in order to think about it, what we're going to do is we're going to say, let um, my test point S0 be somewhere really, really close and, and even closer than I've drawn here. So I've got some test point S0. And it's some tiny radius away from P1 with some angle. And so zooming in, I've got P, P1 is here and my S0 is maybe down there. And uh, to get the angle between P1 and S0, this is my, my angle phi. And this is my, my S0 is right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the angle criteria to see for what value of phi is my test point on the root locus. And so uh, it's on the root locus if the angles, so the sum of the angles from the zeros minus the sum of the angles from the poles equals 180 degrees. Well, there's no angles from zeros, so I have to think about what are the angles from the poles. So here we're saying that the angle from uh, P1 uh, um, P1 bar, rather, to S0 is going to be straight up. Notice that, that if my test point is really close to P1, my phi1 angle here, this is 90 degrees, uh, assuming that S0 is really, really close to P1. So that's about 90 degrees. That's that angle. The angle from pole 2 is phi2, and if you figure out what that is from the geometry, it's, it looks a little squished on my screen here, but that's actually 135 degrees. Uh, it's it's a 45 degrees plus a 90 degrees over here. Uh, so that angle we know. And then the angle uh, from P1 to S0 we just said was phi. And so the sum of the angles from the zeros is equal to zero. The sum minus the sum of the angles from the poles is minus 90 from P1 bar minus phi1 from uh, the from P1 itself, and then minus 135 from P2 at the origin, and all of that has to equal 180 degrees plus some integer times 360. Well, I can solve. I can solve that because I, I can solve for phi1. And if I do that, I get phi1 equals minus 45 degrees. So I can go back to this example now and say, now I know that's in fact, it's going to go along this line as it turns out and then it will eventually turn around and go along that asymptote. I can do the same thing for finding the angle from P1 bar, but I don't have to because I know that the top and bottom of the, you know, above and below the real axis, I have conjugate symmetry, so I know this has to be at plus 45 degrees, and then it goes, and it goes along that asymptote. So that helped me clean things up a lot. Uh, especially near near P1 when K is still pretty small and not large so that the asymptote really applies. In general, we have these rules. If I have a single pole at some location in the S-plane all by itself and I want to know what is the angle that this the, the root locus departs from that open loop pole, well, the angle is equal to the sum of the angles from all of the zeros to that location minus the sum of the angles from all of the other poles in the system to that location, so not including that pole itself, uh, minus 180 degrees and then plus minus some integer times 360 in order to get the final result within plus minus 180 degrees. Uh, what we didn't show, but what we could show is if I happen to have a system where I've got multiple poles at the same location, like two poles, I would say that this would have multiplicity of Q equals 2, but I could generally have multiplicity of Q equals 3 or 4 or 5 or whatever. Um, each one of those poles goes off at different angles, and the, the rule for figuring that out is Q, the multiplicity, times the angle of departure is equal to, again, the sum of the angles from all the zeros to that location minus the sum of the angles from all remaining poles of that location 
minus 180 plus minus 360L. So the only difference is Q then precedes this phi, and I have to figure that out. One example I'll let you do is if the open loop system is a double integrator system with nothing else, then we know there's two asymptotes. We know that they go to plus and minus infinity uh, well, along the j omega axis. And we can say, oh, well, the sum from uh, the angles from the zeros is zero. The sum from the remaining poles, well, there are no remaining poles, so that's zero. So I'm going to have on this side minus 180 plus minus 360L equals Q, which is 2, times phi, or phi equals minus 180 plus minus 360L over 2, which is minus 90 plus minus 180L as L goes uh, 0 and 1. So I got minus 180, sorry, minus 90 degrees and then uh, plus 90 degrees. So this root locus would, one pole goes that way, one pole goes that way, which uh, should not be too surprising given what we've already seen in the past. We can also think about what is the angle uh, that a pole arrives at a zero as K approaches infinity. So if I have a a finite pole going to a finite zero, there's an arrival angle too, and that arrival angle is very, very similar, except notice that poles and zeros are switched. So multiplicity, Q could be one here, or could be more than one. Uh, I have the angle is the sum of the angles from the poles minus the sum of the angles from the remaining zeros, those are swapped from before, uh, plus 180 plus minus 360L. So that can really help, and uh, can really help figure out what uh, generally the, the angles are going to be and whether a system might remain stable or not. I'll let you go back to that previous example and figure out which is which. The second rule that we can add to our, our arsenal of rules for figuring out what a root locus should look like is to consider, especially if we know from the asymptotes that the root locus is going to cross the imaginary axis at some point, we can figure out exactly where it does so using the Routh test. So uh, we can say, well, what is the value that causes marginal stability by using the Routh test in a symbolic way? So we fill out the rest, Routh test. I fill out our table with our entries along here, you know, s to the n down to s to the zero and I fill out the table, and I look at the first column, and I find out uh, for what k uh, is an entry in this column equal to zero. Because if an entry in that column is zero, it's uh, right at the borderline between positive and negative, and if I turn k a little bit more, I'm going to have a negative entry in there. And so that value of k is the value of marginal stability. So then I can substitute that value of k to find the, the roots of k, uh, a of s plus k prime b of s equals 0. Alternately, we're going to find that when I've got things crossing the j omega axis, I'm going to have a case where one of these rows of this Routh array is 0. So I could uh, use the Routh test uh, case 3 and find the polynomial that corresponds to that root and simply finding uh, so that a1 of s equals 0 is the factor that is, uh, that is going to, to 0 when I get that uh, imaginary axis crossing. And I can solve that, which is usually easier to do than solving, solving this. Or I could just brute force it. Once I know what k prime is, I just simply let s equals j omega put that k prime in the equation, put uh, s equals j omega in that equation, and solve for um, the omega value. Um, the real part will be 0 that we're looking for. And so that's one equation. And the imaginary part that we solve for will be omega that will give us the imaginary axis crossing. So the Routh test tells us the k. And then after we know the k, we solve for where the the imaginary axis is crossed. The third general rule is looking at places where uh, two different branches of the root locus intersect each other. And 
if we look at those examples from the last section, examples two and five had places where the root locus came together or broke apart. And so they, they were individual points on the S-plane where the, there was intersection. And this can really help clarify some root locus plots, like we'll see on the next page, there's some kind of tricky examples that if we know these locations, it really helps. Uh, here's a root locus we've seen a lot before. So I've got two poles. One of them is going that way and eventually goes up, and one of them is going that way and eventually goes down. And we're interested in that point right there where the root locus branches uh, connect, intersect each other. And if you think about what's happening is as the two pol poles are approaching each other, the gain is increasing. Then they meet and they start going away from each other as the gain is increasing. So they approach each other as the gain is increasing and then they go away from each other as gain is in increasing. So if I take the, the derivative of k with respect to the, the locus, we would see what we call a saddle point. Uh, in one dimension or one direction in the S-plane, uh, it, it appears that this is a maximum, and in the other direction it appears that it's a minimum. So on the real axis, k is maximized at that location, but on the imaginary axis, k is minimized, if you can think about it. There's kind of thinking about it in, in that way. This is what's called a saddle point. And so a saddle point is going to occur when the derivative of k with respect to s is zero. Now, it's a little bit odd to think about it that way because... Um, we would usually think of, well, what's ds by dk or something, but this is really the derivative of the gain uh, with respect to looking at it at, from positions in the s-plane is, is zero. So to figure this out, uh, we know that 1 plus k g of s equals zero anywhere on the root locus, and so I can solve for k. k equals minus 1 over g of s. So that's really the derivative of minus 1 over g of s with respect to s equals 0. If I can solve for all of those locations, I have this saddle point, and I've got a place where the, the root locus intersects. So that gives me this, d by ds of minus 1 over g of s evaluated at s equals s0 equals 0 means that there is a multiple root at S0 locations. We do have to verify that S0 is on the root locus. We do have to plug that value back into uh, 1 plus kg of S equals 0 to make sure that that value of S is a valid uh, location because sometimes it's not. We can end up with extraneous solutions. So here's a, a set of somewhat tricky root locus plots where I've actually completed the plot here. If we didn't know where the saddle points were in the S-plane, it would be much, much harder to draw these plots. So uh, notice that all four of these plots have exactly four poles and no zeros. In the first plot, there's a kind of a symmetry, as it turns out, between the pole locations. They're real and imaginary parts. In the uh, label, then that's one. In plot two, we have that the complex conjugate poles are a little bit to the left of center of the symmetry. In three, the complex conjugate poles are a little bit um, above and, and below where we would have symmetry. And in four, it turns out they're a little bit to the right. And so we see the root locus plots are actually quite dramatically different. So uh, what we can do is we can sol solve for the departure angles. And when we do that, we get the that in this case I've got plus minus 90 degrees, that, that helps a little bit. In this case, in case number two and four, we don't get plus minus 90 degrees, so that helps us a little bit to figure out what might be going on. We, uh, of course, know the, where the real axis is part of the locus. That's pretty easy. It's between the two real poles. We know that there's going to be four asymptotes by the asymptote real rule. We can find out the center of the asymptotes also. Um, but uh, knowing exactly the character of the root locus between those, you know, as they go to those asymptotes is tricky. Uh, 
So in the first example, we look for the saddle points, and it turns out that there's exactly one of them, and it's exactly here. And what happens is that all four branches of the root locus intersect at exactly the same point, and then they go away from each other um, at 45 degree angles. In uh, case number two, we have two branches of the root locus intersect at that location that the saddle point would tell us. And the fact that this departure angle is more than, uh, more than minus 90 degrees, or in, in magnitude more than minus 90, tells us that that's going away from that saddle point, and so it's the other two poles that hit the saddle point and cross eventually. In example number three, it turns out there's three saddle points. There's one there, there's one there, and there's one there. And knowing those three saddle points tells us, uh, again, that those locus, uh, the real part must come together and split, and the imaginary parts or complex parts must come toward that split and again split, and we get that shape that's there. And then finally, in example number four, we have that this angle here is not quite minus 90 degrees, and so it's heading toward the right, and we have exactly one saddle point there. Uh, so that gives us a hint as to the, the nature of what this plot looks like. But these are tricky. So knowing saddle points helps. Knowing departure and arrival angles helps. Knowing the imaginary axis crossings over here, these points, helps. Um, but they're still a little tricky to draw. Once I have a root locus plot, uh, suppose I have a plot and I compare that to my specifications and we determine that yes, it looks like there are places on the root locus that meet my design specifications. Now uh, to finalize the design, I simply need to choose or, or find out what is the value of K that gave me poles at this desired location. And we go back to the very beginning of the root locus rules. And what we said, equations 6.1 and 6.2, at the beginning of this chapter said that the root locus was anywhere where these two equations were satisfied. Magnitude of k equals magnitude minus 1 over g of s, and angle of g of s is angle of minus 1 over k. We've already seen that the angle equation, or the phase equation, is the one that's used to create the plotting rules, to actually plot where the locus exists. The magnitude equation is what tells us the value of k that gives us a certain desired pole location. So what I do is I plot the root locus. And um, I don't know, maybe I de determine on this locus that this point right there uh, which must correspond to that point right there by symmetry. Uh, I don't know where the other two poles are exactly, but I know that they're either on the real axis or they're off to the left here. Uh, I determined that that is going to give me desirable performance, and so I'm going to call one of these S0. Well, to find the value of K that gives me S0, I plug in S0 in here, and I simply evaluate G, the transfer function of the open loop system at s equals s0, minus 1 over that, take the absolute value of that, and that is k. That is the gain that puts one of the poles in the root locus at s0. So summarizing, uh, this is in very small print, but I think that if you print out the course notes, you should be able to read this pretty easily. Uh, these are the root locus drawing rules for a standard 180 degree root locus. And step one, we mark the poles, the roots of the denominator, by x and the zeros with an O of the open loop system. We know that there's going to be a branch of the locus departing every pole and a branch arriving at every zero. That's step one. Step two is the real axis rule. We draw the locus on the real axis to the left of an odd number of real poles and zeros. Step three is what happens as k goes toward infinity, the asymptotes. So first we have to say how many asymptotes are there. 
there's n minus m, where n is the number of poles, m is the number of open loop zeros. We calculate the centroid alpha, which is the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros over n minus m, which, by the way, we can shorten as this, as the minus a1 coefficient plus b1 coefficient over n minus m, if those are readily available. And then we find what are the angles of the asymptotes, where phi is 180 degrees plus l times 3, l minus 1 times 360 over n minus m. Step four, if we want some refinement, we compute the departure angles from the poles and the arrival angles to the zeros using this formula where Q is the multiplicity of either the pole or the zero, and Q could be one. And as we see, the, the psi is the angle from the zero and the phi is the angle from the pole. Uh, step five, if we want even more refinement, we look at the, the Routh test uh, to compute where the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. Uh, step six, it looks for places where the, the root locus comes together. And we do that by taking the, the derivative of 1 over uh, g of s. Uh, and then we notice that two root locus come together at 180 degrees, and they break away at 90 degrees. We've seen examples of that. Three come together at angles of 120 and depart at angles rotated by 60 and so forth. And then we complete the locus. We uh, use some experience. Now this recipe says we make reference to illustrative loci for guidance, but that's basically saying use experience uh, to know how these root locus plots work. And then finally, when I do the root locus, how do I use it? Well, I find some desired pole location that exists on the root locus, and it meets specifications, and then I compute k, the k value that put it there is k equals 1 over the magnitude of b over a, or 1 over magnitude g evaluated at s0. Those are the, the root locus plotting rules. We've, we've seen them all. We've seen where they come from and how to use them. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, practice that you'll need to get really familiar with it. Um, but after you do so, the root locus is going to be uh, quite uh, something that comes quite naturally to you, and it's going to be very, very helpful for knowing how a controlled system is going to work. How does feedback impact your system?